I am in the high desert of Idaho within the boundaries of the Idaho National Laboratory, about 900 square miles in the literal middle of nowhere in the high desert. And I am at EBR1, the Experimental Breeder Reactor Number 1. This is the world's first ever nuclear power plant, and it's now a museum, so we're gonna go check this out. I mean, there's the middle of nowhere, and then there's the literal middle of nowhere. It's really beautiful out here, though, with all these mountains, the buttes, sagebrush, really unique atmosphere. But then over there, there's some nuclear laboratories. You can see behind the old gates, it's all preserved. You would have probably been killed if you went through this back when it was in operation. Let's see, look at that, the world's first nuclear power plant. We got 14 foot clearance. You can see it was built out of brick. Here you can see some pre-nuclear age technology. This is a 1909 Oliver three disc gang of plow. This region in the desolate high desert of Idaho was designated the National Reactor Testing Station and EBR-1 was completed in 1950 and the first reactor was installed in early 1951. This is one of the four original light bulbs first powered by nuclear energy here in this building. President Lyndon B. Johnson visited EBR-1 in 1966 to dedicate this plaque, making it a National Historic Landmark among the earliest rounds of designations in the country. The primary goal of this location was to develop a breeder reactor which would maximize the useful energy from natural uranium. A reactor was built nearby called the Borax-3, built in 1955, that powered the nearby town of Arco, making it the first city in the world lit by atomic power. I do have a video on the town of Arco, by the way. Borax-3 also suffered from the world's first nuclear reactor meltdown. I noticed that they don't have that advertised much. This is a radioactive disc that was used to monitor the radiation being emitted. And you can still hear it, which I think means there's still a little bit of radiation lingering. That was the nuclear fuel storage vault. It was stored inside those stainless steel rods when they weren't being used. It was right here at 1.50 p.m. on December 20th, 1951, that an electricity generating nuclear power plant produced sufficient energy to eliminate four light bulbs, which were strung up right here. Uranium-235 atoms fission when struck by a neutron, that produces heat and waste, and the chain reaction was harnessed here to generate electricity. The heat was carried to the reactor core by liquid metal, which headed a second system of liquid metal, which then heated water to make steam to drive the generator's turbine. This reactor could also be fueled by plutonium-239, and that's what makes this a breeder reactor, because it bred more plutonium-239 atoms than the uranium atoms it consumed. The signatures of those present were engraved in a wall nearby, marking the historic moments. After the successful first test, the output was increased to 100 kilowatts, enough to electrically power all equipment in the building, and the plant was able to produce its own electricity throughout its lifetime. This is the control room. The operators could control all the things in here, and they could stop the chain reaction if they needed to. These very complex panels have all the buttons and switches to control the equipment making electricity.
There is no rule that you can't touch in here. And I got to press the reactor shutdown button. That's pretty cool. This little button could have been used to avoid the first nuclear disaster. This is the top of the nuclear reactor, surrounded by thick concrete walls. The uranium fuel rods were lowered into the core right where I'm standing, and then fission would take place in the core. Some vintage science displays that are pretty neat. Looking out of one of the few windows, again, this area is still an active nuclear laboratory and employs about 4,000 people. This is the rod farm, where the fuel rods filled with liquid metal were placed when removed from the reactor. They were washed off, the waste went through the disposal hole, and then they were stored individually right here. Right next to it is the hot cell. They would use these big mechanical arms to inspect and repair all the radioactive stuff. To protect from all the radiation, there are 34 layer windows and the walls have a thickness of 39 inches. This is an actual manipulator used in a hot cell at a different plant years after EBR1, but you can actually try this one out, however, not with highly radioactive materials. Now heading into the basement to see where all the reflector controls and repairs were. The neutrons could escape the core, so that's where the uranium-238 reflectors absorb some of them to make new fuel and bounce enough back to continue the chain reactor no problem. Raising and lowering the reflector happened through this window, and it was controlled by an operator down here. These windows are very thick and dim because they actually would absorb radiation and light. This is where the reflectors were repaired. They were made of uranium-238 bricks, meaning that when penetrated by neutrons, the atoms converted into plutonium-239, the new type of fuel first produced here at this plant. Also, smoking was allowed here by the workers. They could smoke in a nuclear power plant. That's safe. In this underground room, the liquid metal was cooled using this big thing. It was converted into high temperature steam and then piped to the generator. Just so you know, I'm no nuclear engineer and quite frankly have no clue what the actual mechanics of this stuff is, so sorry if I miss anything or sound like a moron. Here's some old fashioned displays about the area, like how all this was once prehistoric Lake Bonneville. And here you can put your hands in radiation-proof gloves and see where scientists used to mess around with actual highly dangerous radioactive stuff. 
EBR2 was built here at the Idaho National Laboratory in 1964 when EBR1 service was put to an end, and EBR2 was in use until 1994. This is a replica of what the control room was like there. It was a lot larger and could do a lot more, but it was all based on the pioneering efforts of EBR1. And apparently EBR2 was superior. No Chernobyl could happen here because America. These two gigantic engine reactors outside EBR-1 are pretty interesting. HTRE-1 and 3 here were built at EBR-1 in 1955 as nuclear reactors, which could heat air for an airplane turbine. So basically, they're atomic jet engines from a serious Cold War effort to build nuclear-powered planes. The experimentation with these to see if they could actually power an airplane engine took place right here where the engines still stand. They may have eventually worked, but enough scientists and officials believe the project was too dangerous to continue with. Some desired to build an atom-powered bomber, which was even considered impractical and obsolete back then. But here are some concepts of what could have been. Nuclear-powered bombers, making the world a safer place for all. This unusual lead shielded locomotive was built to move said atomic planes into hangars. You can see EBR-1 right there. I'm at a nearby rest stop on US Route 20 and this historical marker is on the Lost River. You can see the Lost River here. I wonder how much radiation is in there, how much nuclear waste has been put in there. And here's the marker on nuclear reactors and it says that over 50 more nuclear reactors have been built in this area, and that's more reactors than anywhere else in the world. 